Give me a round of applause. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Duncan. Um, this is a Prezi, um, which you can access online if you want to. Um, in fact, I've uh, put a post this morning on Peerless. So if you go to Peerlist and um, search on S Fractal, my handle, or the title, or EF17, you can get a copy of the talk and, and get ahead of me if you want to to see what, so what I got coming up next. And also, if people have questions, and when you think of them when I'm on a particular slide, you can go ahead and type them right into Peerlist. And at the end, I'll, I'll do those questions first, whoever put them online. And if you think of questions tomorrow, I'll answer them tomorrow or whatever. Um, uh, standard disclaimers, the, all the views expressed here will be my own, not for any of the people I have worked for or currently work for or anything like that. Um, it is just after lunch. We're still waking up. Uh, let me get a feel of who's here. Can I have everybody raise their hand who's age 40 or younger? All right, the vast majority of you um, were born after I graduated from college. So I'm old. <laughs> so, um, uh, another little test. Okay, everybody raise their hands. Okay, put your hand down if you've been hacked, someone in your family's been hacked, your company's been hacked, or you've been impacted by any hack. There's actually more hands up in this crowd than in a normal, normal place I talk at. So that's good. You can all put your hands down now. Thank you. Um, so cybersecurity has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, I happen to live in northern Virginia outside Washington. We get the Washington Post every day. This is from just a couple weeks ago. Um, I will have to say to those of us in the cyber community, this is a little bit like a headline that says, the Army uses guns. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but... Um, unfortunately, there have been some other incidents. Uh, this particular one's in Philadelphia where the, where the train systems um, were hacked into, and probably many of you are from the Bay Area. You probably remember this one when they ransomwared the, uh, the BART system. Um, so unfortunately, cybersecurity is in the news a lot lately, and that's because all said and done, um, the hackers are winning. And, and why is it the hackers are winning? Because um, we live in a bunch of glass houses, so it's real easy to throw rocks at it. Where the, the houses are the software, um, and the software has a lot of vulnerabilities. And I do think we in this room, in this particular ecosystem, uh, can do a lot better and, uh, and actually you know, will be more successful in the future because of some of the things that are done with our language, and that's what I'll talk about um, a little bit more. Um, so one of the reasons I know that it's easier for the attacker than it is for the defender is because I've spent most of my career being a defender. Um, but my career got a pretty much a jump start back during the first Iraqi war, uh, back in 1990 and 1991. Um, I happened to have been doing some work for, for the US government, so I had the right clearances when the war started and they needed somebody, and this new cyber stuff was nobody really understood it that well. Um, so I did get to work uh, with some of the uh, information warfare people um, in the early days, and it really impressed upon me how much easier the offense has it than the defense. And now I get to go to a lot of hacker conferences and stuff like that, and it, it is a lot of fun to be offense, but it's way better to be defense. It's a harder job, and it, it really needs to get done, and again, I think we have some of the tools to uh, help with that, um, so I'll have more on that later in the talk. Um, I am an official member of the Tinfoil Hat Brigade. This is me being inducted into it. Um, and um, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Um, so th that is something you really need to think about a lot in this space. And um, I'll have a lot of what we in the, in the uh, cyber world called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I will have a lot of that throughout my talk. Um, but it is a large, where there's a lot of problems, there is a lot of over opportunity. Um, so let's talk, instead of talking, why should you be doing cybersecurity because you're afraid of something, let's talk about because that's where the money is. Um, so the prediction is that in the next five years, one trillion dollars will be spent on cybersecurity. That's a really, really big number. Now, embedded in that number is some of the work from this ecosystem. I'm sure WhatsApp is in there, because WhatsApp is a, is a security application. Um, but I actually think it could grow to be a, a much larger uh, segment of it. Um, and if you're looking for work, there's one million currently open jobs in cybersecurity. Um, now, if you think about it, there's a lot of job openings in cybersecurity. That's another reason why the offense is winning, because there's just not enough people um, working on the defense. And um, unfortunately, if you saw the talk, um, one of the talks in the morning on the things going on in the Internet of Things, I think there's another talk uh, tomorrow on it, um, computers are becoming more and more pervasive. They're being in more and more things. And as they become more and more things, 
I mean, it's no big deal. All said and done, it'd be embarrassing to me if my computer crashed right now, but it's not going to be the end of the world. However, if I have an insulin pump and it's connected to the internet and somebody hacks into it, I could literally die. Okay, and so the, the safety threat of, secure, of software has not really been um, looked at as much as it should. Uh, an organization I could recommend to everybody, um, I'll talk about in a second. Um, but we can't count on somebody else solving all these problems. The cavalry isn't coming, um, so I am the cavalry and so are you. And there is a volunteer organization called I am the cavalry um, that you can get involved with helping with particularly safety critical um, items and, and how to make them more secure. And with the Internet of Things coming, um, I think, again, there's large opportunities for the Erlang, Elixir, OTP, Beam, et cetera, um, stuff to, to go with. A um, little bit of cyber tutorial to sort of get everybody on the same page. Um, some of the things I'm going to define, maybe a lot of you know, some of them I might define a little bit differently uh, than some people use. For those people who know me, I'm very semantically pedantic, so um, I'll get into a little bit. And I think it'll, it'll help a little bit to calibrate to when we get, do get into talking about the ecosystem and, and what can be done. Um, so I'm not going to spend the rest of the time going over all the different vocabulary. Cybersecurity, just like every field, has its own set of words that it would take hours to explain. And it's got a bunch of domains, and I'm not going to explain this slide either. They're there just to say it's a very complex field with a really lot going on that I, I can't cover it all in a few minutes. So I'm going I'm to keep it fairly simple. Um, first myth to bust is there's a common myth that, well, you don't really need good security. You just need to have better security than the next guy which is the standard, you know, I don't need to outrun the tiger, I just got to outrun the guy next to me, um, kind of example. And the problem is, in security, a better example would be you have to outswim the school of piranha. And then it doesn't matter if there's 10 other people with you, They're, you're all going to get eaten, um, and swimming's a lot harder and everything else. So what we need is we need security, and security is like the boat, um, but just because you have security, you also can't be stupid. Um, you can't stick your hand in the water <laughs> if you're in the boat. And we have an awful lot of that that goes on also. Um, <clears throat> so I used the, uh, the tiger example before, obviously what was in the news on the Washington Post, and in a lot of cases there are also a lot of armies basically. There are now whole divisions of the army, uh, doesn't matter which country you're in, you're against all the other countries and what's going on here in cyberspace, that put a lot of effort into exploiting these vul vulnerabilities. But all said and done, the reason they can is because the vulnerabilities are there. Um, some more vocabulary. Um, common, um, the common words in the cyber world are you're on the red team or you're on the blue team. So I've spent most of my career on the blue team. I've been defending assets. I've been trying to keep the hackers out of the stuff that I'm doing. If you're on the red team, you're the attacker. You're the guy who gets to exploit those vulnerabilities and go in. Now, another set of, of words that get used are black hat and white hat. So a red team is attacker, a blue team is defender, and it's generally associated with the black hat, the bad guy, is the attacker, and the white hat is the good guy, is the um, defender. Now, this is one of the areas where I'm going to be a little bit more semantically pedantic than most. Um, it's not good guy and bad guy. That's, a, that's an emotional judgment. Depends on which team you're on. The other guy's always the bad guy. Um, my definition of the white hat is the one who has the permission of the asset being attacked to have the attack occur and they understand the risks involved. And it is a very common thing to do what's called pen testing or penetration testing, um, that you want someone to test your defenses. So it is a white hat on white hat. That you, you give the red team permission to attack you for the purpose of finding your vulnerabilities. Um, but if you are attacking someone else, then you're a, you're a black hat. Um, as many of you in the room are software developers. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of the Agile Manifesto. If you haven't heard of the Rugged Manifesto, I'd recommend you look at it. It's like the Agile Manifesto, but for the purpose of, of Rugged DevOps. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in it, but one that I particularly want to emphasize to everybody uh, is this particular phrase in it. I recognize that my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security. So when you're designing, recognize there are evil people out there, and they will be trying to get into your code, and they will take advantage of it. Now, I don't know all the things it'll take to secure your code, but you probably do. If, if you have to sort of wear the hat of, hey, I'm turning, turning sides today and going to do something bad to whatever I'm working on, you probably can think of some stuff. Well, do that, think of it, and fix it um, is, is one of the, the main messages. 
Um, no talk on security could be complete without discussing risk. It's sort of a mandatory. If you talk about security, you've got to talk about risk. Um, so define it a little bit as a risk is you have something, the asset, that somebody else wants to either take from you, corrupt what you have, or um, know what it is. So it's either confidentiality, in integrity, or availability. Um, so they want to do something to you, and they have some capability to do that. That's the vulnerability. And in our space, most of the vulnerabilities are, are, are due to software bugs. Now, if you have one of these risks, okay, what can you do about it? Uh, you, should be, you should be assessing your, your risk posture. And one of the things you do is you avoid the risk. You avoid the risk by getting rid of the vulnerabilities. Put your patches in, for example. Um, a very major um, security breach of a few years ago was something called Heartbleed, Heartbleed which was a, a bug in, in SSH. I believe the number is still at around 30% of the systems are not yet patched. And this is two years ago. It was in all the headlines. It was a really big deal. People just don't go around to fixing stuff. Fortunately, uh, none of our programs had any of those issues. Um, the other thing you can do is you can mitigate the risk. That's where a security technology comes in. You put in firewalls and intrusion detection machines and proxies and um, SIMS, which is a type of thing that looks at all the threats that are coming in and, and hands it off to an analyst for decision, uh, for, for making decisions what to do about it. That's called mitigation. The other thing you can do is transfer the risk. That's where cyber insurance comes in. You can pay somebody else to basically accept your risk. That's what you do with your house with fire insurance. You worry about your house burning down. You pay a little bit each year. If your house ever burns down, the insurance company has the risk of paying for building you a new house. You can do the same thing in, in cyberspace. Um, but the most common thing that's done is acceptance, which is just say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If they get in, they get in. Um, and people do the acceptance of the risk much too cavalierly and not formally enough. They don't actually realize the risks they're taking. I'm sure the president of the Target Corporation never signed off on a form that said, yes, I agree if I let this HVAC vendor you know, do our stuff, I'm going to get fired later. Um, but that is what actually happened. <laughs> so, um, Talked about red and blue, talked about black and white. Now I'm going to talk about gray, which gray, strangely enough, doesn't go with black and white. It goes between red and blue. Um, and there's a very good report I'd recommend um, everybody look at. It's put out by George Washington's uh, Center for Cyber George Washington University's Center for Cybersecurity. Um, it's called Into the Gray Zone. And it talks about the, when you're on the blue team and you're doing defense, you're basically doing stuff within your space. Um, and if you're either a bad guy or a military organization, you're out attacking somebody else. There's this big area in the middle in between where there's some work needs to be done on what is allowed to be done, what isn't allowed to be done. Uh, blue teams can leave their space and do things, but doing the classic thing everyone says is hacking back. Hacking back is not a good thing to do if you're a commercial enterprise. If you're in the military, maybe, but uh, for most of us, we, we can't really do that. Um, now, probably many of you are thinking, hey, yeah, yeah, you defined a bunch of cyber stuff, but it doesn't really matter to me. I work on Unix, you know, I work on Linux machines, and I work in Erlang or Elixir, and they don't have any of these problems, right? So let's talk about that just a little bit. I do think that we in this community are better off um, than everyone else, and I think mainly due to OTP, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more in a second. Um, but if we call, sort of, I'm going to switch analogies now. Instead of the glass house, I'm going to switch to the three little pigs. Um, if you call the rest of the world as living in a straw house, it's not very strong, and the wolf, wolf can blow it down, and we'll use that as our, as our base point. Um, and now let, let's look at our community and, and see where we, we stand. So first off, uh, oops, somebody must have been hacking me. <laughs> Oof. Um, on all these relatively famous things, bad things that happen, to my knowledge, there's been no Erlang or Elixir or any Beam-based uh, programs involved. That's, that, that's a good news kind of thing, okay? Um, there's a database that's kept of all the known software vulnerabilities. It, uh, as of a couple days ago, when I last checked it, it had 83,000 entries in it. There were 13 entries for Erlang in there, okay? That's a really small number relatively to the big one. And of the 13, only two of them were in the last three years. Now, that's good news, okay, it's probably good news for the wrong reason. It's probably because actually nobody cares about Erlang and Elixir and everything else. So, so that's probably not a good thing. And in security, we call that security by obscurity. And yeah, maybe it could be a very outer layer of your defense, but it wouldn't be something to count on. It's like hiding your key under your front doormat. It, it's probably not going to keep you out, keep the bad guys out. Especially when you have a lot of, remember the risk, you know, risk goes with threat. There's some very high, from what we call high value targets. There's some very high value targets on the list. You have the gaming industry. You have video games. You have privacy apps. You think all those 
foreign, um, all those nation states I had on that previous chart aren't interested in getting into WhatsApp or Whisper. Um, so we, we probably do have to take security more seriously than we have been. And we, I think, are very close to being able um, to make it very secure. Um, so what, what's good about our, our ecosystem in this regard? Um, uh, Francisco gave a talk in this room just before lunch on the five nines of availability. The five nines of availability are the things that were put in place to do that are all very applicable to security. The fact that you can write code and it works even when you have bugs in it is, is very powerful and very good because it's really those kind of vulnerabilities that, that hackers take the biggest advantage of. So let it hail, fail is very good. But I think the lightweight processes is at least as important. Um, in my opinion, as sort of cloud computing um, comes into the forefront now, there is going to be much, much more concurrent processing going on. And as we figure out how to design software better, we're going to start designing smaller, simpler programs that interact more with each other, which, which again, the Erlang ecosystem is, is very good for, for doing. Um, and it's particularly good um, for security applications, which is what I'm pushing. Um, <clears throat> so I think doing all of that gets us out of the straw house and into the stick house. I don't think we're quite up to where we need to get to yet, which is, which is the brick castle. Um, so that's, that's where we want to do. And um, I think, again, I think we're almost there. I think the, um, one of the more important um, aspects of that is the whole let it fail. Um, take, take advantage of that, but you have to add to it, let it fail, you have to add to let it fail with let it be hacked. You have to say, take into account not just that you have to worry about single faults and double faults, you have to worry about malicious activity. If you just think about it a little bit, you can put that a little bit more in. Uh, again, it's going to be program dependent on what you do, and I'll have some specific things to, to do in a little bit. Um, but yeah, again, I, I, think that, um, I think that the progression of, of computer languages and software development is going to start leading us to a, a whole new paradigm that I think we're in a good position for. Now, what can you do to harden your code more? Um, it's not, this is not rocket science. This was written like 4,000 years ago or something. Um, you have to think like your enemy. You have, to, you have to think like, oh, what if this afternoon I decided to become a bad guy? What would I do? And then you have to assume, well, somebody might do that. It might be an insider threat. It might be, you really can't tell the difference between an insider threat and an intruder because once an intruder gets into your system, they act just like an insider anyway. So you do have to take those into account. Um, and again, we talked before about the red team. The, you can have a white hat red team. You, you should be thinking, you should be testing your systems to try and get into them to see what you can figure out to do and then and then fix those particular issues. Um, now, there are some very common mistakes that are made. Um, there's people put up a, a bunch of these lists. This particular organization is the Open Web Application Security Platform, I think. I'm not sure on the page. Um, but it's a group of people who basically get together and say, hey, we want to make the web more secure. Let's do things to make it more secure. And they, for a number of years, have been publishing a basically top 10 stupid things to do list of all the hacks that come out in the last year, what were they caused by? And it's really sad. The list has not changed much over most of the time they've been publishing it. And all of them are mistakes that software developers could have fixed, not all of them, most of them are mistakes that software developers could have fixed in their code. Simple things like input validation. In, in functional programming, it is much easier to do input validation than it is in some of the other languages, but just because it's easy to do doesn't mean everybody does it. <laughs> okay, so you just have to make sure you, you again, think like the enemy, put, it, put, in, put in, not only keep the bugs out, but design it in a way uh, that can handle it. Um, and then you need to think out of the box some. Um, well, actually, let me do this one first. So again, the, the let it fail aspect is, um, besides let it fail, let it be hacked, you have to think about, as this, as this phrase says, you have to think about what will somebody be trying to do um, and then do that. Well, not do that, then fix it so they can't do that. Um, so thinking out of the box, uh, this cartoon, in case it's too small for the people in the back, basically has a couple um, bad guy security geeks have stolen a laptop and saying, oh, we can't get in because it's encrypted with a super great encryption that we can't do it. When the real life is, no, just take the guy, hit him over the head until he's going to tell you what the password is. So again, you're only, only you, have to, you have to think about all aspects of, of, of the problem. Um, 
Let's see, how am I doing on time? I should go in there. All right, so I want to talk about attacking, uh, responding to attacks at machine speed. Now, first is, why do we need to do that? What, what, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, so this is from the Verizon data breach report. Um, it's actually a couple years old. I think the new numbers might actually be a little bit worse. And what it basically says is that the attackers are sophisticated, adaptive, automated, and can get into your system within seconds, okay? And the defenders are manual, slow, and not very coordinated, and it takes them a long time to find people and get them out. In fact, the average dwell time, the time between the hacker getting into your system and you getting them out of their system, is currently 210 days. That's a really long number. It's actually been growing. I think the reason it's been growing is not because hackers are getting better, it's because we're actually getting a little better at finding them, but when we find them, we find out they've been in there for three years, and that makes the averages go up. So, um, but, um, I was at um, RSA, is a big security conference held here in San Francisco. It was held about a month ago. Uh, me and 43,000 of my best friends were over at the Moscone Center. And um, I heard a great quote from one of the speakers, from the speed of light to the speed of lawyers, okay? And one of the problems is the defense does somewhat work at the speed of lawyers. And you do actually have to get your legal team involved when a breach occurs. But what you should have done is gotten your legal team involved before the breach. You don't have to not only worry about the technology aspects, but worry about the process aspects. Get the legal team involved before so that you have permission to do what you need to do to respond in real time. But the problem, the fundamental issue is technologically the attackers are way ahead because there's lots of vulnerabilities and they have lots of automated ways to, to take advantage of them. Um, so the military has recognized this problem. Um, they have this standard uh, military speak of this stuff called C cubed I, Command Control Communications and Intelligence. And they started up some work um, a few years ago on this thing called Sticks and Taxi on basically how to share threat intelligence, how different companies, different governments, governments with companies can share, hey, what are the bad guys doing? So that you know, when bank one gets hacked, they can share to bank two, three, four, how to, how to fix it and, and learn from those problems. Um, work's been going okay, but it's got a lot of process issues because all said and done, nobody really wants to say, hey, I've been hacked. They don't want to tell everybody else that. It's too late, you've already been hacked. It's not helping you to tell anyone else. Everyone else would benefit, but you wouldn't. So they have a lot of process issues with that. Um, so now they're trying to solve the, um, the command and control side of the issue. So in their speak, command and control is C2, uh, and there's an effort going on that I've been involved in called Open C2, and that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. Um, and it's part of something called the Integrated Adaptive Cyber Defense, which says, hey, if we got all these Pete's parts, we gotta make them so they have standard interfaces to each other, so you know, the stuff's all changing very quickly. We can't, what we currently have today in these technologies is proprietary interfaces and you can get locked into them. So instead, let's, let's figure out what the functions are, this is how they define the function. Sensing is, is the indicators that are coming out of all these sensors. Sense making is the, hey, we should add some context around it, and this isn't just an IP address, it's an IP address that's on this bad guy list that we already have, stuff like that. Then make a decision about it, oh, it's an IP address that's on a bad guy list, we probably should block it. And then do something about it, acting is the actual, hey, let's go do something about it. And the first baby step in all this is to, hey, we, we say go block that IP, we should all be speaking the same language, we should have a common protocol um, to do that with. And that's what OpenC2 is designed to do. Um, so they got together, some government people, some commercial people, a bunch of large users of technology equipment, and a bunch of vendors, and said, okay, let's create this language, uh, and they did. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of the detail of the language, but I will have some, uh, some uh, we'll have a demo of it, and it will be in a couple slides later. Um, <clears throat> but why do I think it's, why, why do we need it, and why do I think it's gonna, um, gonna be used? The reason the government wants it is because of this military, you know, when we get attacked, we want to respond and attack in, in real time. And that's a, that's a good reason. Um, the reason commercial wants it is somewhat of the same. You, you want to re be able to respond quickly. They, of course, can't do the attack back stuff, but they can get into these gray space areas. But more importantly, I think the major driver of this is going to be, like major driver with most things, is going to be money. Um, and what's the money involved here? There's really two main drivers. Uh, security's going to, we're going to spend a trillion dollars over it in the next five years. It's a really big sum. So even if you can shave a you know, few percentage points off it, they're still really big numbers. And I actually think we can shave large amounts off it. Um, and one of the reasons is because as the world does move to more um, concurrent processing, more shared resources, more you're changing what you're doing, you can in real time adjust to how much 
how much your security spend is. Most of the time you're sitting there at a, I'll call it an idle state, you're not spending much on it. You get some big DDoS attack, then you spin up a bunch of resources to deal with it. You pay for them for the amount of duration you need them, and then you spin them down again. Well, to do that, you need this automated command and control that, that I've been discussing. So it's gonna save some money. Right now, you, you basically pay for all those extra resources and leave them sit there 99% of the time when you're not under attack, then you get attacked and you use them. They were worth that amount of money, but it'd be better if they were cheaper. Um, and then the other main driver is the vendor lock-in I referred to before. Um, I worked for AT&T uh, for a large number of years. Um, I used to buy tens of millions of dollars worth of, of security gear, and we'd have these bake-offs, and company A would beat out company B and C by a little bit. And it wouldn't beat them out because they're better in all areas. They'd beat them out because they're better in, you know, sort of the sum of the total was better. And then six months later, the company B that we didn't pick would be better than company A, but I'd be stuck because we'd already have, have locked into whatever we were doing because it wasn't just that we were buying hardware back then. It was also that they had a, an ecosystem that had a bunch of interfaces that were proprietary, and I'd have to rip them all out and put new ones in. It was too expensive. Now with this stuff, we won't have to do that. So I think that will be a major driver. Um, so now let's talk OCAS. So an OCA is a um, South American tuber. Um, or OCAS could be Open C2 API Simulator. Um, I don't like acronyms, so to me it's a potato. But um, <coughs> uh, so this is something that I've programmed to work on work with this this new protocol that's come out, Open C2. Um, and <coughs> I should probably say it's programmed in Erlang, and I'm not really an Erlang programmer. Um, I actually took the Erlang course from Mark, who's in the back of the room two years ago, then of course ignored Erlang for a year, so forgot most of it, spun up again about a year ago to start some work, and then started on this work about three months ago. Um, but I have been an Erlang enthusiast for about 15 years, because um, I managed the group at AT&T. Um, in the year 2000, I moved from doing a bunch of spooky government stuff into the part of uh, the research part of AT&T Labs into something I used to call the ampersand, because we were the and in R&D. We used to take stuff out of research and turn it into, into development. And, um, and there were some really good people in the, in the group. And a couple of them were really hardcore functional programming enthusiasts. And um, they have these great arguments while we're going to coffee on you know, OCaml versus Askell versus Erlang um, that I sort of learned all this stuff from their coffee arguments. Um, but they never actually used any of this stuff in our job. I mean, that isn't what we programmed in. Um, and once I moved in the job and um, there was some great network research being done by Michael Merritt and Karsten Lung and Tim Griffin, so we had, you know, we were a big chunk of the network. We had a lot of network visibility. I said, hey, this stuff would be really useful for the, for the um, commercial cyber guys like the government used to do uh, when I was in the government space. So we should make some tools to do that. And I thought of this tool called, uh, we called it Fathom, for plumbing the depths of the network. And as we're getting, it was sort of a little side project we're going to do on the side, and we're starting it up. And uh, Gary Hodgson, who's sitting in the front row here, who's one of those functional programming enthusiasts, convinced me to let him do it in Erlang. Um, so I did. The project was a huge success. It's still running. It's handled, you know, it, it saved AT&T a lot of money in, in, in people doing things. Um, but it's also just, it's made us much better at what we do. And it was always up, and it always worked, and, and it was just, it convinced me Erlang was the best thing. But again, I was a manager and a security architect, not an actual programmer. Um, I retired three years ago and said, hey, I should actually you know, do some useful things now. And I've always wanted to learn Erlang. So, <laughs> so I took, took the course, learned it, and this is programmed in it. Um, but that's all a long way of saying, you know, feel free to, feel free to throw rocks at it. I'm still a beginner. Um, going to cover in a little bit more detail um, the purpose of it, um, go through the architecture real quick and um, show you where it is. I'll show you where it is right now. It's at that link, or you can go to my um, GitHub repository and see my cloned copy of it. It's got a bunch of stuff on how to help. Please help me. Um, ground rules. It's got things like the collective code construction contract, how, how, you can, how we can all work together on it, uh, style guides, and all the usual stuff. Um, so why did I do it? Well, I'm on this standards committee trying to put together this standard, and I want it to actually work. I want, I want different systems to be able to interwork with themselves uh, more with it. Um, so we need this thing called um, validation and verification. We need, to, we need to verify that any particular implementation works, but more importantly, particularly in these early stages, we've got to validate the spec is right, that we're actually 
making the protocol the right protocol. Um, and so we've already been using it for this. Um, I programmed this in Erlang. Some other people program some uh, actual implementations in Python. We get them to talk to each other. Even before we get them to talk to each other, we start doing stuff. I say, hey, I'm doing it this way. And they go, well, I'm doing it this way. I'm going, hey, hey we aren't going to talk to each other when we do that. Hey, we should change the specs so that it says whichever way is the right way doesn't matter. We should at least do it so they can talk to each other. Um, so it's been used for that already. Um, but you can, it can do a lot more than that. You can use it to actually simulate what's called an actuator, a, a, an actual security device, a firewall, an IDS, a proxy, a malware detonator, um, lots of, there's, there's a really long list of actuators, um, which is useful if you're building a, 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 an orchestrator, the thing that's doing these decision-making things. Um, but it's also useful, was, no, okay. <clears throat> Thought maybe I was out of time already. Um, uh, it's, it's also useful if you're, um, when you're building one of these, you're building them to what's called a profile. Hey, this is what we mean by a firewall, and the standards body is what's putting out these profiles. And again, we need to validate those. So it's, it's again, come in handy. We're working on the first one now, the firewall one, and it's come in handy for that. Um, but if you can simulate one of them, then you can simulate a network of them. And if you're simulating a network of them, you can simulate being a, an entire enterprise network if you want. And so again, when one orchestrator, um, you know, say Bank of America wants to tell M&T Bank, hey, we just got hacked and we, we think, you know, this is what we did to prevent it in case you want to do it. They do this thing called a course of action. You can give those kind of information. It's not, hey, I want to put this particular command in this particular firewall. It's more the, hey, you want to mitigate this big thing. The, the language handles both. And you want to test those kinds of things. Um, you can do, use this for that also. Um, and that gets into gaming playbooks. It's if, if you're going to be attacked, how do you want your system to respond? If you want to operate at machine speed, you can't have a person making that decision. You've got to have pre-thought out what are the, under these conditions, we want to do this in response. Those are called playbooks, and you can practice them, work out the details of them, make sure you're doing it right. And of course, if you can do that on the defensive side, then you can take advantage of that on the offensive side. You can go ahead and red team these. To, are, are we, can we find a way around? We've made this set of playbooks, now let's play bad guy and see if we can beat them. And this, the simulator can be used for all those different things, or will be once some of those things get finished. Not all of the particular things I just said are finished yet. Um, still a work in progress. So here's a particular OpenC2 command. Um, it's got four components. The action is what you want to do, deny. Um, the thing you want to deny, in this particular case, an IP address. In other words, that's a bad guy. You don't want to let him in. You want to deny it. What do you want to do it with? You want to do it with a network firewall. And then there's some modifiers in case you need some extra stuff, like I want a response back and, and things like that. And uh, it's a RESTful API. What are you used for RESTful APIs? Well, I used Cowboy. Uh, comes in on an ATT, that particular JSON that we just saw comes in on an HTTP post, comes to Cowboy, runs the various, runs through the various um, behaviors. I'm going to be caught up with myself here. Um, and calls the handler for this particular, you know, for, hey, it is a JSON, it is a command, it is an OpenC2 command, great, hand it to the OpenC2 handler. Uh, first thing OpenC2 handler does is it spins up a whole separate server. If there wasn't one there already in a simulator, you'd already have this stuff up. That says, hey, what's the environment? Am I simulating the language? Am I this particular kind of firewall? Am I an IDS? I respond to different commands differently. So you, you sort of need to know what you're doing there. Um, parse out the actions. There's 33 different actions that could be coming in in that command I showed earlier. The one example I'm using now is deny. So hey, go talk to the deny server that's got all the, hey, what's, what's being a deny mean? Um, what am I going to do it to? Again, targets is an extreme. There's a really a lot of choices for what can go here. So a bunch of different servers to simulate. There's an IPv4 address, there's an IPv6 address. This is a, a you know malware.com domain, whatever. Um, and then hand the hand off the uh, modifiers. And when you're all said and done, you then say, okay, I've sort of checked that. Yeah, deny isn't one of the actions I need to do, and IPv4 is a is a valid thing. But I don't know if if um, semantically they all go together. Um, so I need to sort of now check everything, so you have them all talk to each other and come out with, yeah, this particular, I'm doing a sunny day scenario, so this particular command works, it all goes through, and then you say, great, now go do it. Change the state of the simulator from being what it was to what it would be as if you really got this command and you were a real network and, and, or a real device, depending on what you're simulating, um, and you did it. And then when you're all said and done, you send an answer back to the um, RESTful API that it came in on, and you're done. Now what's left to do? Um, a lot still. 
Um, and when I demo this in a second, you'll see that the responses look like a bunch of internal Erlang gobbledygook state, because that's what they are at the moment, because the OpenC2 body is still arguing about what responses should look like. Actually, they just recently settled it, but I'm, I have to now code it in. Um, I want to simulate being an actual firewall. I want to simulate it being a network of them. Um, I want to work with, with bigger, Graybox is a, is a simulator of a big network, work with that, and maybe even connect it into a real, a real firewall. Real quick, do a demo. Uh, first thing you always do is you run your tests, prove that, yes, I, I was a good coder and did write a bunch of tests. And uh, the secondary purpose is you'll see there's basically a test per command, so you can see a lot of the commands that are in the language that way. I was cheating in that regard. Um, and then I'm going to run it from shell so you can see all the junk it creates when, you, when you're running it. And I'm going to switch over to a graphical HTTP client. And again, I cheated and put in all that code that all that JSON that I showed you earlier in that slide is already there. Um, and that's in right up here. And this is, is basically that same thing that was on that slide. And I can go send a request. And an answer came back. Um, and you can see lots of stuff happened on the back with, uh, with debugging messages and just keeping track of what's going on. Uh, but what it, what it responded with here shows that, um, yes, it did spin up a couple, you know, it didn't use that in this particular case. I just turned it on. It didn't have an IPv server before, so I went ahead and turned that on. It didn't have a, a firewall server, so it turned that on. Um, and then there's some other stuff in there. Um, so yes, it is real code. It does work. Um, yes, it's probably not the best written code ever, so help is welcome. Um, for the sake of people who um, couldn't see the live demo, there's some canned versions of it on these slides. You just real quickly saw what I typed in, the same as before. Um, so let me conclude with hopefully you've learned a little bit about security. Uh, I've sprinkled throughout the talk some, these are a couple free books on security. Uh, uh, Twitter, tweet me or comment on um, Peer List. I'm happy to share plenty of information with anybody who wants it on, uh, if people want more information. Um, maybe you want to get involved and go to some hacker conferences. I highly recommend the B-Sides conferences. DEF CON is this really big conference that, yeah, you could go to, but you'd probably be better off at a, at a um, local one. There, the B-Sides San Francisco was just a, was just a few weeks ago. Um, B-Sides Washington is also called Hacktoberfest. It's in the fall. Um, I highly recommend it. They have the coolest badges. Um, they're bottle openers. <laughs> so a lot, a lot of beer flows um, at those. Um, I'd mentioned before the Eye and the Calvary. If you want to get involved, this is their actual, um, uh, you can get a little bit more from them from their, from their, their website. Um, but help out in the safety of software. Writing, writing safer software will all be better off if we do that. Um, maybe the next billion dollar Erlang company is going to come because one of you has an idea. If you do, you know, send me at least a few thousand dollars of it or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, red team your code. Think like a bad guy. Think not just your code, but whatever you're working on, whatever project, whatever company you're in. Um, think about, yes, people will do bad things to me, so therefore think about them ahead of time. Just the thinking about them will, will make everything better. Uh, and again, software developers, hopefully you'll build security in a little bit more uh, because of what you've learned today. Um, obviously, I'm very passionate about OpenC2. I think it's going to make a really big difference. Um, I think five years from now, we'll look back and go, How, why didn't we do this a long time before? How could they not have done this? Um, but so I, I, think, I think life is going to get better with it. Um, and obviously, I've shown you my crappy code and want some help with it, so please, please help. Um, <coughs> And then uh, finally, I'm going to end with a quote um, from Dan Gear. He is one of the, um, if I find it and don't screw it up, he is one of the uh, cybersecurity's leading thought leaders. And he always ends his talk with this, and I always got a kick out of it, so I'm going to end mine with it. There is never enough time. Thank you for yours. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions? Can you really retire? 
I'm, I call it I call it semi-retired. I actually really enjoy cybersecurity. Um, so when I retired, um, I did. I had health reasons so that I didn't want to be working 60 hours a week, but I wanted to still stay in touch. So I, I work at most 20 hours a week and at most three weeks in a row, and people pay me obscene amounts of money to tell them intuitively it's obvious things they should be doing, so it's a great job. <laughs> so, so I can't, by the way, you're all welcome to hire me, but only for little bits. <laughs> so. I wonder whether the open C2 stuff communicating between these banks is itself an attack target and Joe. You know. That's an excellent question. Again, being hackers, we all think very evilly. So yes, um, if, if I was a attacker, it would be a very high value target. If you ever noticed when the Air Force attacks anything, the first thing they take out is the enemy radar system, right? This is a very similar kind of, um, of scenario. Um, so there's a whole different group actually that's going into, we, to keep this problem tractable, we actually early on had some of those arguments that said no, let's make that a separate wrap around around the top. It doesn't actually affect what, you know, whether you use demand or block to tell an IP, it isn't gonna change our wording. Uh, let's make that a separate group that is doing that. But yes, it is, it is a worry. Um, 